Hello, BookTube. I've got some mail for you today on a bright, sunny, crisp day, part of New England's endless countdown towards this storm that's coming. This, we, have a, we have a big rainstorm coming on Wednesday. Uh, it looks like it's a surefire hit, but the days are being exorbitantly clear and calm and beautiful ahead of time. <laughs> I don't know what that means, probably nothing, uh, but it's been a wonderful day for dog walks. Just wonderful. No way to overheat. No way at all. Uh, and we have a pile of packages here to go through. And the last of the packages, the box at the end, I'm pretty sure is not only a violation of rule number one on this channel, which for you new people is don't send me a book. It's going to seem natural. I, I have lots and lots of books. I love books. I live, eat, sleep, and breathe books. But I almost certainly either don't want what you think you might want to send me or I already have it. Uh, so don't do it. <laughs> and I have a feeling that the box at the end of this video is not only a violation of that rule, but a flagrant violation, an absolutely exorbitant violation. <laughs> we shall see. We'll have to get there first. So let's, let's do these, uh, the ones on top, and then we'll save the box for the end here. I imagine these are all going to be 2024 releases. I don't think we'll have much in the way of 2023 stuff. Uh, okay, yeah, this one is for April. <laughs> Good Lord, April, that's a long time away. Uh, this is a novel by Ryan Chapman called The Audacity. Uh, and we are back to ugly covers. Let's hope not, right? Let's hope this is an aberration. We've been, we've been spoiled with, with really pretty U.S. covers. We don't want that to change now. Uh, let's see here. Uh, let's see here. In, in a year when one billionaire turned felon began his prison sentence for defrauding investors in her unicorn biotech startup, began her prison sentence by defrauding her investors in her unicorn biotech startup. One billionaire turned president continues his next election bid amidst legal troubles of numerous criminal charges, and a billionaire turned social media mogul offered one billion to rename a globally recognized brand with a phallic joke. Reality indeed feels stranger than fiction. Okay, all right, a little labored, but uh, to make sense of this world where the antics of the world's wealthy elite often veer into the outrageous, Brian Chapman offers an amusing take on the audacious spirit of mega wealthy in his upcoming novel, The Audacity. Uh, okay. Uh, we, we got words are outrageous and audacious there. <laughs> but, uh, um, anyway, widely acclaimed for his debut novel, Riots I Have Known. I read Riots I Have Known? Do I know you, Ryan? Uh, which was long listed for the, the Center for Fiction Award First Novel Prize and dubbed one of the funniest American novels to come around in years, according to Michael Schaub at NPR. Uh, Ryan Chapman has proven, has a proven talent for capturing the world's absurdism in bracing satire. Bracing satire seems almost gone. We'll see. Uh, we'll see. As he turns his attention to the schemes and sociopathic tendencies of the obscenely wealthy, Ryan's sophomore novel glimmers with mordant wit and refreshingly earned laughs. <laughs> so do we have a plot? Uh, uh, largely inspired by a certain billionaire above, the audacity takes place on the agonizing weekend before a blockbuster, blockbuster expose is to, is to reveal Victoria Stevens' multi-billion dollar health tech startup as a massive fraud. Victoria has gone missing, perhaps faking her death, and her husband, Guy Sarvanathan is left to face the fallout and potential jail time. Guy considers fleeing to his native Sri Lanka an admission of failure against the American dream. Unwilling to face the impending crash of his lavish lifestyle, he takes the corporate jet to seek solace among his people. That is the point, the 0.0001% who've gathered on a private Caribbean island to decide on one global problem they'll eradicate forever. <laughs> okay, some of this is sounding promising. Uh, as Guy drinks and drugs his way into oblivion, he reflects on his immigrant family's lifelong lessons to embrace assimilation, the marriage that scooped him out of his life of a mediocre composer, and the hopelessness of escaping the catastrophe before him. Meanwhile, Victoria narrates her side of the story from off-the-grid location in the California desert. All right. Okay. All right. I like this. This has the, the potential for very good satire. Uh, in scribbled diary entries shot through with cultish self-help mantras, she plots her comeback, confident she'll prove everyone wrong again. <laughs> okay, so who is the author? He is Sri Lankan, of course. Uh, he's a Sri Lankan-American writer originally from Minneapolis. 
and they specify Minnesota. <laughs> they specify the Minneapolis that's in Minnesota. <laughs> Uh, and currently based in Kingston, New York. God, Ryan, you moved from Minneapolis to Kingston? Do you have something against summer? <laughs> Is it, does it, did it offend you somehow? <laughs> okay, well, we, the, the rest of this comes with blurbs of praise for the audacity. So that would be authors that got an advanced copy and were asked to provide a blurb, not a review. The, the, that's different, right? And we have, who do we have here? Anybody that I know? Amitava Kumar is on here. Uh, David Goodville. Oh, Teddy Wayne. Teddy Wayne gives us a blurb. I don't know what that means. I, with Blurbs are tricky because they're not vetted by editors, right? So if you're, if you're Ryan Chapman or if you're, you're Ryan Chapman's publicist and you know that Ryan Chapman knows somebody, maybe he knows Teddy Wayne, uh, maybe they got hot and heavy at Yado one year, well, then you can't trust that blurb. You don't know one way or another. Whereas if it's a blurb drawn from a source, a critic, uh, well, then it's likely that it's unlikely that they know the author, and also most of the time they'll have an editor to vet what they're doing. Uh, which we do get. We do get here for his other works. So there are critics who, uh, let's see here, Michael Schaub, already noted for NPR, Ron Charles from the Washington Post, uh, Adrian Westenfield for Esquire, John Warner for the Chicago Tribune, The Millions liked his last book, Sam Lipsight liked it, uh, and it got a star review from Publishers Weekly. Uh, so I'm going to have to rack my brains to see uh, if I remember riots I have known. It's not drawing, it's not, it's not ringing a bell right now. Uh, but anyway, this comes out uh, on April 2nd, so long time from now. No need to worry about it. Let's, uh, let's just move on. I <laughs> have plenty of other stuff to do here. Let's see what this next one is. Ooh, okay. What a stylish thing. Uh, no information at all. These things, some of these things must be coming from warehouses. I'm, I'm not getting any, uh, any slip for them. This is, excuse me, this is probably um, a December release. December 5th seems to be when every, every book in the world is being published, so probably then. This is Carl Melantes, who uh, wrote Matterhorn. And this is Cold Victory. Look, very nice. The whole cover is shaded green from the Aurora Borealis. Uh, very nice. All right, so we'll, we'll just read from the uh, the dust jacket. Like, we were in the bookstore together, and I was nagging you. <laughs> so, uh, in 1947, Finns are caught between East and West, and years of attacks from the Soviet Union have taken their toll on the country. Louise and Arnie Kosky arrive in Helsinki in the depth of winter for Arnie's new position as military attaché to the American legation a high-level diplomatic job gathering military intelligence in the turbulent years after World War, the United States re-established diplomatic relations with Finland. Almost qualifies for Dr. November. Hmm? Uh, when Arnie reconnects with Mikhail Bobrov, once a close friend from their time fighting in the Soviet army, but now a military attaché to the Soviet legation, they embrace each other as brothers. Several drinks later, they've agreed to a 500-kilometer, 10-day ski race starting at the Arctic Circle. There aren't enough drinks in the world. <laughs> As their husbands prepare for the race, Louise strikes up a complicated friendship with Mikhail's wife. Yearning for a child of her own and horrified at the overflowing orphanages in Helsinki, she devises a plan to raise the money so that they so desperately need. But the stakes are higher than she imagined. With the wartime alliance between the U.S. and the Soviet Union deteriorating in front of them, Arnie and Mikhail in the throes of their breakneck race, what began as an innocent challenge takes on a competitive edge of international proportions with fatal consequences. So who fatal consequences? Are the wives competing with each other or are the husbands or both? Uh, okay, great. Well, I don't know when this comes out. I don't have a sheet for it, but it sounds really interesting. Uh, so cold victory <laughs> with a reference to the cold war there then we'll do the uh last envelope here and then we get to the box the very disobedient the very naughty naughty box <laughs> unless i'm wrong i could be wrong about the box. let's see this next one all right well this next one has a sheet whatever it is that's good uh oh no <laughs> the sheet is just an invoice <laughs> that doesn't help anybody <laughs> okay oh all right well we already know this uh, we've already seen this doesn't have a sheet in the book this must have come from the warehouse but this is the finished copy of Anthony Grafton's book, Magus, The Art of Magic from Faustus to Agrippa. Anthony, Fa Anthony Grafton is fantastic. He's absolutely fantastic. He has unlimited credit in the Bank of Steam. Uh, so I think this is a December release, pretty sure of that. These probably all are. Uh, this and Cold Victory both are. Well, let's do this again for those of you who might have missed it the first time. 
Uh, in literary legend, Faustus is the quintessential occult personality of early modern Europe. The historical Faustus, however, was something quite different. A magus, a learned magician fully embedded in the scholarly currents and public life of the Renaissance. And he was hardly the only one. Anthony Grafton argues that the magus in the 16th century Europe was a distinctive intellectual type, both different from and indebted to medieval counterparts, as well as to contemporaries like the engineer, the artist, the Christian humanist, and the religious reformer. Alongside these better known figures, the Magus had transformative impact on his social world. This book details the art and experiences of learned magicians, including Marsilio Ficino, Pico della Mirandola, Johann Tri Trithmius, uh, Heinrich Cornelius Agrippa. Crafton explores their methods, the knowledge they produced, the services they provided, and the overlapping political and social milieus to which they aspired, often the circles of kings and princes. I remember this book. Do you remember this? Uh, during the late 15th and early 16th century, these erudite men anchored debates about illicit and licit magic, the divine and the diabolical, the nature of good and bad magicians. Over time, they turned magic into a complex art, which drew on contemporary engineering as well as classical astrology, probed the limits of what was acceptable in a changing society, and promised new ways to explore the self and exploit the cosmos. Uh, Yvette, I would read this if it said this is a study of my grocery list because it's Anthony Grafton, but I want to point out what I think I pointed out with the advance copy, which is that all that is interesting from a historical point, but there is no such thing as magic. There is no such thing as magic. The, the magus the figure in medieval or a high Renaissance time period was a counterpoint to philosophers and natural historians and engineers only in the sense that it was a word. It was a word on a piece of paper or the equivalent of a business card. Not that it, it was not the equivalent in the sense that these people were doing anything real. They weren't doing magic because magic doesn't exist. I know that you can now get a degree in magic, not the history of magic, but doing magic itself at, a, at an accredited university, probably more than one. But nevertheless, it is not real. In the 21st century, we have decided collectively as a decadent West that anything we feel like being real is real, but that's not true. <laughs> that's not true. If magic is real, do it. Do it for me. Demonstrate it to me. Go into a blank room you've never been in before and I'll surround it with recording information and then do it. And you won't be able to because it's not real. No one's ever been able to do it. No one ever will be able to do it. There is no supernatural element to our existence. I don't know, Anthony Grafton is a really smart guy and a fantastic scholar and writer. I don't think I'm going to need to worry about encountering that in this book. Uh, I just thought I'd, <laughs> for, as a public service message, I thought I'd mention what used to go without mentioning. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> then we get to the naughty box. I could be wrong about this, but I don't know. I think uh, one of you has already confessed that you are going to that you are going to be naughty and send me something, uh, and this could be that. I don't know. It's giving me that kind of a, uh, a feeling. It's quite heavy. Uh, what have we got here? Oh no! Oh my God! Oh, I was accusing you all. I, I, there's one of you out there who knows. You know, the guilty party knows who they are. But I was. Oh my! I was accusing you improperly. These are advanced copies for next year. The only reason the box was heavy is because they're both e frick enormous. <laughs> they are absolutely enormous advanced copies for next year. They're both from the great folks at Harvard University Press. Fantastic. So this first one is uh, comes out in May, and it's a thousand pages long. Yes, eight hundred. It's eight hundred pages long. It is a gigantic biography by Chen Jian of Zhou Enlai. Gigantic thing from Harvard here, so we don't. We don't have a sheet once again. So and the next one's the next one's even bigger. Yeah, the next one's eight hundred thirty-two pages. So these are both huge. That's why the box was heavy. Uh, let's read this together. We'll just read the the back cover copy is already done. This comes out in uh, May, in early May, uh, and this is billed as the definitive biography of Zhu Enlai, the first premier and preeminent diplomat of the People's Republic of China, who protected his country against the excesses of his boss, Chairman Mao. Uh, Zhu Enlai spent 27 years as Premier of the People's Republic of China and 10 as its Foreign Minister. He was the architect of the country's administrative apparatus and its relationship to the world, as well as to its legendary spy master. Richard Nixon proclaimed him, quote, the greatest statesman of our era. I wonder how Kissinger felt about that. Uh, yet Zhu always, has always been overshadowed by Chairman Mao. Chen Jian brings Zhu into the light, offering a nuanced portrait of his complex life as a revolutionary, a master diplomat, and a man with his own vision and aspirations 
who did much to make China, as well as the larger world, what it is today. Never had a biography in English, as far as I know. Uh, born to a declining Mandarin family in 1898, he received a classical education and as a teenager spent time in Japan. As a young man, driven by the desire for China's development, he embraced the communist revolution as a vehicle of China's salvation. He helped Mao govern through a series of transformations, including the disastrous Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. So to see how responsible he was for the Cultural Revolution. Yet, as Chen shows, he was never a committed Maoist. Well, okay, all right. Uh, his extraordinary political and bureaucratic skill, combined with his centrist approaches, enabled him to mitigate the enormous damage caused by Mao's radicalism. Okay, all right. <laughs> You're going to have to work a bit to convince me of that. But when he died in 1976, the People's Republic of China that we know of was not yet visible on the horizon. He never saw the glistening 21st century Shanghai or the broader emergence of Chinese capitalism. But it was Zhou's work that shaped the nation whose influence and power are today felt in every corner of the globe. Okay, I am totally on board. I will definitely review this. Uh, I will also get other people to review it. So who is the author? A leading scholar of the Cold War and a history of modern China, Chen Jian is Distinguished Global Network Professor of History at NYU and NYU Shanghai, and the Hu Shi Professor of History Emeritus at Cornell University and the Zhejiang Distinguished Professor, Visiting Professor at East China Normal University. That's a lot. Okay, so fantastic. <laughs> Wonderful. Absolutely great. Did not expect big fat biographies. Big fat biographies is my favorite kind of thing. I didn't expect them this late in the year. And then we have something for April that's even bigger. This thing is absolutely enormous. <laughs> oh my. Could not be happier to see this. Uh, this is The Letters of Emily Dickinson, edited by Christiane Miller and Domhnall Mitchell. Boom, look at the size of that. So let's go through this, shall we? This is billed as the definitive edition of Dickinson's correspondence, expanded and revised for the first time in over 60 years. Emily Dickinson was a letter writer before she was a poet, and it was through letters that she shared prose reflections, alternately humorous, provocative, affectionate, and philosophical, with her extensive community. While her letters often contain poems, and some letters consist entirely of a single poem, they also constitute a rich genre all their own. Through her correspondence, Dickinson appears in her many facets as a reader, writer, and thinker, social commentator, and comedian, <laughs> friend, neighbor, sister, and daughter. This book is the first collected edition of the poet's correspondence since 1958. A lot of you will remember that. Probably some of you have that copy of the letters of Emily Dickinson. I did, once upon a time. It didn't look like this. It had her on the cover, right? Mark Richardson probably has a copy. I has a copy of everything else that's ever been printed. <laughs> I used to have that. Um, it presents all 1,304 of her extant letters, along with the small number available from her correspondence. Almost 300 are previously uncollected. 300 previously uncollected letters, including letters published after 1958, uh, letters more recently discovered in manuscript, and more than 200 letter poems that Dickinson sent to correspondence without accompanying prose. Imagine just getting a poem in the mail from Emily Dickinson. Imagine that. This edition also redates much of her correspondence, relying on records of Amherst weather patterns, historical events, and details about flora and fauna to locate the letters more precisely in time. Good Lord, can you imagine? So she, may, she makes an offhand mention of a new moon in a letter written in April, and you go, you go checking through Amherst weather patterns to see if she's got the date right. How wonderful. Uh, finally, updated annotations place Dickinson's writing more firmly in relation to national and international events, as well as the rhythms of daily life in her hometown. What emerges is not the reclusive Dickinson of legend, but a poet firmly embedded in the political and literary currents of her time. Her letters shed light on the soaring and capacious mind of a great American poet and her vast wor world of relationships. This edition presents her correspondence anew in all its complexity and brilliance. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Good Lord, this thing's going to be huge when it's in hardcover. All right, well... Okay, we're going to have to save the tongue lashing for another day, because <laughs> this is all from publishers. This, this is The Letters of Emily Dickinson, a brand new edition with hundreds of new previously uncollected letters. How incredible. Uh, then we have Zhu Enlai, a uh, new life of a pivotal formative figure in the People's Republic of China. We have the finished copy of Magus by Anthony Grafton. Anything new by Anthony Grafton is fine by me. We have Cold Victory by Carl Malantes. A lot of you probably read Matterhorn. I think a lot of people did. That's a, kind of a book club favorite there. 
Uh, and The Audacity by Ryan Chapman, that most perilous of all things, a sophomore novel. <laughs> many, many is the writer who wishes they could just skip from fire in the belly of a debut all the way to established fiction rather than writing a sophomore novel because they are justifiably awful. <laughs> they have a long rec recognized history of being awful. We'll see. This one could break the curse. A couple of them in 2022 did, or 2023 did break the curse, so maybe so. But uh, we've got the Grafton and the Marlantes are the only ones for this year. I think they're both December 5th releases. But anyway, that's the mail. Nice big pile of stuff for me to pour over. How wonderful. So I'll wrap this up for now, and I'll see you soon. Thank you, Booktube.